So the first, the second pillar, which is prayer, is trying to connect people to God, to put people into a state in which they are connected. Now, how is that done? It's done by obligating prayer. Prayer is not choice in Islam. There are prayers that you can do out of choice, but there are prayers that you have to submit to. So again, the idea of submission comes into the idea of praying. I submit to five prayers a day. That is something that I submit to. That's a rule. I'm being told pray five times a day and I can either say no, I don't want to pray or I'm going to pray. I recognize this is an obligation binding on me. And that's belief in Islam. Now there are many Muslims that don't pray anyway, which is another matter. And again, it's like anybody who doesn't follow their tradition. They still might believe in it. They're just not practicing it. Now the prayer, there are five prayers in a day. And I, this is based on an equatorial day, all right? Here's sunset. And here's sundown. Here's your meridian point. Here's your midnight point. So this is day, this is night. Now, the first prayer begins at dawn for people normally. If you ask, you know, what's the first prayer? Most people will say dawn prayer. In reality, the first prayer according to the Muslims is the sunset prayer. This is also people who know the Jewish tradition are familiar with the fact that the day begins at sunset. Right? This is the same in the, in the Islamic tradition. The day begins at sunset because it's based on a lunar month. The month begins at the sighting of the lunar moon for the Muslims. And the lunar month begins with sunset. That's the first time that the moon is visible when it's new. Now, this this prayer lasts, it's got a short window until the red is gone out of the sky. That's the time for Maghrib. So Muslims are supposed to pray it very quickly. Now it's interesting that the Quran says in many places that the two ends of the day are the times when people should remember God. Particularly <coughs> these two ends, the dawn and the sunset. And I think something that many people notice, and the Muslims take it as, you know, this is uh, one of these aspects uh, that they take from the Quran of everything being in praise, that oftentimes animals gather at those periods. You'll see birds gather at, at sunset, and they'll gather at the early part before the sunrise and chirp away. They literally gather and congregate during that time and chirp away. The crickets in the evening start the, the frogs, that these are all seen as literally praises. That's the way the Muslims view it. Now I'm sure, you know, evolutionary uh, biologists would say, <laughs> the cricket's cooling himself off, um, <laughs> you know, and, but it's interesting, I mean, why uh, things in creation do these things, gather and do these things. The Muslims view it as really acts of praise. The next prayer goes from when these, the red is gone, and this is called Maghrib prayer or, or the sunset prayer. The next prayer is when the sun, all the red is gone. And this goes basically until midnight, one should do it. And really for the first third of the night, if you divide the night into uh, three parts between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., it should be done in that first third of the night after the redness is gone. That's the best time. And then after that, you're delaying it, and the prayers are not encouraged to be delayed. And it's prohibited to delay them until they actually go out of the time altogether. So that is the next prayer. And then this period is all encouraged for people who want to do extra prayers. The night time in particular is encouraged. Many Muslims uh, do night prayers. Many do not. But there are many Muslims that do do night prayers some portion of the night. 
I mean, my teacher, uh, I think minimum, was maybe three hours. That was his practice, to stand in prayer. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the man who's here, that's his practice, because uh, I've lived with him for uh, over a year in different places, and, and that's his practice. So uh, many Muslims will make it a practice to pray at night. It's a good time. It's a time of meditation. It's a time of tranquility and stillness. And also, there's a, there's a nice Hasidic tale uh, of why the prayer is a special time. Um, in, in, in this Hasidic tale, I think Buber talks about it, that, um, that the seeker of God is like a thief trying to steal something precious. And the thief always works at night. The, the next prayer is dawn prayer, and that begins at the first light. Now there's an interesting phenomenon called the false dawn which is a white light that will show up towards the middle uh, of the eastern horizon and then it disappears and then after that the second dawn comes up. The second dawn is the dawn that the Muslims are, begin their uh, prayer and that will go until right before sunset. All of that is time that you can pray. The preferred time is at the first time but any time before that you can pray. So technically we could pray anyway from 4.30 till about, is it time to break? Okay, sunrise, yeah, sunrise, until the sun rises. Um, so we could technically hear pray anytime from 4.30 to about probably quarter to six or 5.30, whenever the sun rises. It would be perfectly acceptable. Unless, if you, if you overslept, there's nothing, there's no responsibility. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the sleeper has no responsibility. The madman has no responsibility, and the child has no responsibility until they uh, reach puberty. So the sleeper has no responsibility. But there, there is an idea that if you went to sleep not intending to get up for, for the prayer, then you are responsible. That you, that you should intend to get up for the prayer. That if you just say, you know, I, I set your alarm for eight, then that, that would be considered something wrong, that you've done something wrong. And then the sun comes up now you will notice a phenomenon because all of the prayers are based on the sun. This, the night prayer when this, all the red is gone from the sun. The dawn prayer when the first light of the sun comes. And then the next prayer, what you'll notice as the sun is moving up in the sky, and I think this will be a really interesting exercise uh, to give to some of your students if, if you're interested in doing this because it will teach them some very interesting things. One of the interesting and fascinating things about human beings is that uh, astronomy is really where we get our mathematics from. Early man became very fascinated with the sky and began to examine and watch the sky and watch the movements of the stars and began to discern certain patterns, right? And over centuries, an accumulation of knowledge occurs, right? I mean, this is what um, uh, Richard Feynman mentioned that uh, the people who are familiar with him, Six Easy Pieces and... Uh, he, he was a Nobel Prize winning physicist from uh, Cal Poly and got his Nobel Prize in quantum electrodynamics, whatever that means. But uh, he, he said that, uh, for the, that the physicists and, I, and the astronomers, it's true, and others, he said really what we're like is, is you know, people that are watching the gods on Mount Olympus play chess and they don't let you in on the rules. So what you do is, you know, you have, what, 40, 50 years of thinking in your lifetime. You start watching the game and you notice, oh, the bishop only moves that way and the pawn moves this way and the queen moves this way and you start discerning rules. And he said, and we begin to write those down, right? So we're discerning that there's patterns here, but we really haven't been given a whole lot of information. And one of the things he says is that the problem with this is that every once in a while something like castling comes up and, and you know, <laughs> You, you, you have to start all over again. What was that, you know? So what happened is people became, for some reason, obsessed with the meridian point, determining when the sun reached that meridian point. Now, in the Quran, it says that we gave you the sun and the stars. One of the reasons the sun, according to the Quran, was given to human beings was to allow you to measure your years and learn mathematics. 
I mean, that's literally in the Quran that one of the wisdoms behind that is to learn mathematics. Now, just, I mean, this is like, they'll probably get maybe a little upset if you start bringing geometry into a world history class or something like that, right? But the idea here is that what, what, what will happen, how the prayer is determined, is you put a stick here or you use your body. And if anybody's interested in learning this, I can teach them. All right, because I really, this is fascinating. I've done this with children at Muslim camps. They're fascinated by it. They really, they really enjoy it, and it's a lot of fun. Um, what, what you'll notice is, towards the western horizon, a shadow shows up that's very long from the early sun. And this shadow will continue to decrease as the sun's moving up until it reaches its shortest point here. And this is the 90 degree angle if, if you're looking at the 180 circumference, right? Zero to 180. The 90 degree angle. Now, if you're in an equatorial uh, place on the earth, which is a very small narrow place where the sun will actually be directly overhead twice a year like Mecca, the shadow will disappear completely. The sun is literally directly over your head and the shadow disappears. For us, uh, you'll notice in the winter the shadow's long, in the summer it's short. Based on the movement in the winter towards the south of the sun, shifting the earth. I mean, I, I prefer to look at it geocentrically just because that's ex phenomenologically or experientially. We experience it geocentrically. So I'm going I'm to speak in geocentric terms, all right? So I'm not trying to, you know, uh, get out of uh, abstract thinking, but I'm just trying to look at this as a, we experience it as human beings. That instead of looking at it as the shift of the, the earth, I'd rather look at it as the sun is moving over, because that's how we see it, and that's how young people experience it. The, when the sun moves over to the south, uh, then the shadow becomes longer in the winter. Now as the sun's moving back towards the north, then the shadow is getting smaller and smaller. So you can actually see the movement of the shadow during the year. It's a very interesting thing and I've, I've been doing it for a while so I'm very now accustomed to knowing I mean I can pretty much work out what time of the day it is just on my shadow if the sun's out because I know the shadow pretty well in the winter and the summer and if you live with Bedouin who know the sun really well it's phenomenal how accurate they can tell you the time based on just looking at the shadow. Now there's an interesting verse in the Quran that I find really fascinating because when I first read this and I first began uh, examining shadows uh, I, you know, I start thinking about and want to look in the Quran. There's a verse that said, Adam tara ila rabbika kayfa madda Haven't you looked at your Lord how your Lord moves the shadow? Now this gets back to a Tawhidi idea or an idea that the sun is a means, but in reality it is God that is creating this phenomenon for us. And then it says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ and had your Lord wanted, He would have made the shadow stationary. Right? So we could imagine a world in which the sun is directly overhead. It would be pretty hot to live in, but the shadow wouldn't really move. Right? It would be stationary. But we do experience a movement of the shadow. And then it says, And we made the sun as a, as a, a prover or an indicator of shadow. Now the interesting thing in Arabic, the word for shade and shadow, which are related in, in English, are from the same, uh, they're the same word, identical word. When I first read that verse, I was really struck, you know, what does that mean we made this, the sun an indicator of, of, of shade or the shadow? So I went to a commentary by Fakhruddin al-Razi, who's a uh, ninth, ninth century Persian commentary of the Quran, and he just gave this really interesting uh, explanation of that, saying that what the Quran here is doing is it's indicating that, that one of the greatest blessings of God that most human beings are completely unaware of is shade. Now this is obviously more obvious in, in a hot country, I admit that, but if you start thinking about it, it actually gets quite profound because what he said is what shade is, is a mixture of light and darkness. And the only reason we can see is because of this admixture of light and darkness. If we were in pure light, we could not see, and if we were in pure darkness, we could not see. So shade, in fact, is everywhere, and it's happening all the time. 
right now there's a mixture of light and darkness in this room which is enabling us to see and what the Quran is saying had it not been for the Sun you wouldn't even thought about the shade it's not something that you would give a whole lot of thought to so there's an idea of learning about the shade and seeing as, as literally a proof of, of the existence of God that's how Razi uses it and the other thing about shade which is interesting is that the, the paradise is described as shade spread out it's just shade spread out so what will happen is in a northerly climate in the summer the shadow will reach its shortest point and what you can do is get the students like to put a stick up with a with a piece of paper and they can measure it with a ruler so they can watch the shadow uh, going closer and closer until it reaches the shortest point and then they'll see it start increasing again the, the, at the point when it reaches the shortest point that is the meridian point so they can actually learn to determine for themselves the meridian point which is the 90 degree angle now at the point which the Sun moves one uh, uh, one uh, altitudinal degree away from the center of the earth uh, from the center of the sky which is here that is the beginning of the Dhuhr prayer and the sign of it is the shadow begins to increase towards the east now that is the first prayer that was given to the Prophet Muhammad and the idea there is according to the commentators is the interesting thing about the, the, the beginning of the see what's happening is the Sun is rising it reaches the midpoint of the sky and then it begins its decline and the idea is is that that is an indication for the human being that just as we are like the Sun we rise up we reach our full uh, strength and power and then we begin to decline and sunset is cosmologically seen as death the idea that death is imminent that death is coming and so the shade itself is seen as an indication of our own lives that just as as uh, as it as we rise in 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 the east we will also set in the west and so that the day itself has been traditionally by the Muslims des described cosmologically they say that the the mid-morning is like spring it's like the child coming into existence and spring is a fun time it's a, it's a time you know generally where there's the, the, you know it's it's a time of renewal and and it's a time of innocence right and traditionally you know there's a lot of just folkloric uh, things about people falling in love in spring and doing these things because it's an innocent time that's how we associate it folklorically and then summer is seen as uh, when youth coming into youth right and it's it's a time of work it's a time of harvest youth is when you have a lot of energy to to begin to harvest your crops so it's a time of study it's a time of dedication it's a time of exerting a lot of effort and then the fall is seen as the moving now into maturity and this is the time when you benefit from the fruits of your youth that you harvested that your mind begins to mature in a way that you, you, you now become uh, conscious and you begin to use the wisdom of your youth uh, in ways and this is interesting I think Erickson's model is, is, is interesting that he talks about um, uh, this period being productivity versus stagnation right that people begin to think beyond themselves as they reach into this mature period of around 40 and it's interestingly that the Muslim worldview does def demarc the year 40 as this year where where perception begins to change where one begins to get outside of one's egotistical youth and begins to really look beyond uh, one's personal uh, welfare and benefit and really looks how can my life be meaningful and ultimately meaning in life arises out of service out of going beyond the self out of looking at what is what is my contribution going to be to my society to my family to my culture to my tradition and this is this period of the fall and it's a beautiful period because it's a maturing and it's when there's variation in color right you're getting uh, the, the changing of leaves and all these things it's a very interesting time fall and then uh, winter which is uh, moving into that last period of life the dryness the, the, the leaves fall right the body begins to wear and, and, and we enter into that last period of our lives and then death 
and then according to the Muslims rebirth in the next world right which would be the renewal and spring is the sign of that so you can see how in the prayer there is this uh, cosmology embedded here um, I think we'll take a break now all right is, is that good and then what we'll do is we'll come back and I'll open it up for some questions about the first section and then uh, start on the second section okay if you look on uh, the verse 41 just about the prayer I think this is really interesting it's on page 1020 it says uh, seest thou not that it is Allah who praises uh, all beings whose praise whose praises all beings in the heavens I, I have a problem with these kind of translations I'm just gonna do my own here haven't you seen that it is Allah that all beings are praising from the birds in the heavens and the earth uh, and even the birds in flying and everything knows its prayer every creature knows his prayer and his praise so this is really interesting in the idea that every creature is in an act of worship and it knows how to do that the bird knows how it's supposed to praise, right? And so for the Muslims, when they look at, at creatures, they really see that these creatures are all glorifying God and have a prayer that they're doing. So, you know, the praying mantis has its prayer. The cat has its prayer. I mean, you can see the cat in a state of meditation, you know, when it's there just purring away and, and doing, I mean, it goes into a, a really interesting state. And in fact, Zen Buddhists, you know, traditionally talk about the cat and its meditative state. It, you know, that you can learn Zen from a cat. If you want to learn how to do Sa Zen, you watch a cat. And then that, uh, that the human being is somebody who does, does, does not, by nature, know his prayer. That the prayer is something that is taught. And this relates because the, the human being is a creature uh, that has intellect, that has consciousness that it is not inspired uh, or there is not an intuitive although many people will feel some type of uh, desire to pray and will pray and many people even outside of traditions in this culture at some time in their life will attempt to pray from the Muslim point of view you know there is a way of praying and that way involves the body and there is an importance uh, of the idea of being in the body when one prays because the Muslims have always uh, really avoided a, a type of Cartesian dualism of mind-body and we believe in the bodily resurrection although we do see that the soul is is connected to the body and the soul does disengage from the body and in fact the Muslims believe according to the Quran that the soul even disengages during sleep that there is a disengagement that takes place but there is an idea that the body is also part you know that we should not deny our bodies in fact the body is part of our being and does represent a very important aspect of our nature and so the prayer is a physical prayer as well as being a spiritual prayer that the body itself is being used as an act of worship and so there is a standing and then there's a bowing and then a return and then a prostration and each of the limbs is participating in that in fact the seven limbs Hakim talked about that the seven limbs and then there's an idea of putting the forehead right and the nose onto the ground literally onto the ground and the act of, of, of this uh, there's a symbolic act which is elevating the heart over the intellect that there is an idea that that in the act of worship that we're, we are submitting the intellect and we are elevating the heart because the heart according to the Muslims is the organ of cognition and what it is what, what, what it was created to do was to come to know God it was to come to know God so that this is just I mean this is something some of the scholars have mentioned it's not really uh, it's just a symbolic type of and then 
the, uh, the prayer that I didn't mention here was the afternoon prayer. At the point that the sun reaches a point where the shadow will cast the like of a thing plus whatever the shadow at the meridian point was. So most people, if you measure your, your height to your feet, the vast majority of people, what they call the you know, two standard deviations, right? 95% of people are going to come between six and a half to seven feet of their height if you have normal foot size to your height. So if you, if you literally uh, lie down and put a quarter at the tip of your head and something at your feet and then you go, you see and measure it and you go one, two, three, you'll find that your height will generally be about seven feet. And so for the Muslim, the cl traditional Muslims measured the sun with their body, which is again using the body as an act of worship because measuring the sun's shadow is considered an act of worship. It's part of remembrance of God. And so you would go out, if you knew, for instance, like right now, for, for me, the, the meridian, the Dhuhr prayer is my, my shadow is about two feet. So I would add to that seven. So when my shadow reaches nine feet, Asr time has come in, this prayer. So I go out at about five o'clock and I measure it and I'll find it's nine feet. That means I can pray Asr. All right, so that's the, that, that is uh, the afternoon prayer. So those are the five prayers. The sunset, the evening prayer, which is called Isha. The dawn prayer, which is called Fajr, which literally means dawn. And then the uh, post-meridian prayer, which is called Dhuhr. So those are the prayers. That's the first pillar. What you will do, or the second pillar, not including the Shahada. What you will do is you will, five times a day, stop everything. In Muslim countries, traditionally, people left their shops. I mean, this is less so now because Muslims are being secularized uh, like everybody else. Um, but traditionally, and you can still find this in some countries, Muslims will leave their shops. Oftentimes they didn't lock them. They would literally put drapes because for somebody to steal while somebody was praying, even a thief had a sense of honor there, <laughs> right? That that was not a good thing to do. And it's interesting that traditionally many, many court cases were decided based on what's called a oath, where the judge would say, do you swear by God that you're telling the truth or lying? Many, many, historically, many court cases were solved because people were quite literally afraid of uh, bearing false witness or, or lying. In that, and they would say, I can't say that. And, and, and that would literally end the trial. Many, many cases like that historically. So traditionally, people did have a sense, you know, that there were certain things. Even the thief had honor. Um, there's a famous story of Imam al-Ghazali, great theologian and, and scholar, uh, who studied in, uh, he's from Tos in Persia, and he'd studied uh, in uh, one of the great Persian cities, and he had spent two years transcribing all these books by hand, because these people, you know, there weren't printing presses, you wanted books, you had to write them out. He went to the library, spent two years doing that, and on the way back, a, they were, their, their caravan was attacked by brigands, and they were taking his books, and Al-Ghazadi begged this chief of the thieves, don't, you can't take all my knowledge. And, he, and the thief laughed and he said, what kind of knowledge do you have when somebody like me can steal it? Mm -hmm. And Al-Ghazali said that he realized that God had made him say that. To, tell, to let him know and to remind him that true knowledge was not in books. Right. What's that? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> What's that? Uh, the fifth prayer... Let's see, you would have Maghrib, Isha, Fajr, Dhuhr, and Asr is the last prayer, Asr. And that means the afternoon prayer. Now, Just to let you know what the Muslims are encouraged to congregate for the prayer, but they don't have to. It's very highly encouraged to congregate. Women can, can go to the mosque and congregate if they like or if they don't. It's, 
it's not uh, encouraged for them. Uh, the house is actually uh, where the women generally pray in most Muslim cultures. And I will just make mention of certain phenomena that you relate. Traditionally, there was no barrier between the men and the women praying. That is a later uh, innovation. It was not the tradition of the Prophet. The Prophet did not have a barrier between the men and the women. That came later. In many Muslim countries, you still do not have that barrier. For instance, African countries, North Africa, you do not have that barrier. In the Middle East, uh, in the Indo-Pak cultures, you will tend to find barriers. So that is more of a cultural phenomenon. It is not a religious, it's not part of the religious tradition. Even this, what they call the Masharabiyya in the mosque here, which is this uh, a latticed woodwork between the men and the women, that is not uh, traditional. That is, well, it's traditional in terms of Muslim culture, but it is not from the religion. The religion does not say that. That is something that people introduced as a cultural uh, phenomenon. So, and that's important to remember. And there are some countries uh, that, you know, I think a few where, where there, there, there's an extreme patriarchy there, and, you know, women, it's really hard for them to pray in the mosque. And that, again, is a cultural phenomenon because the Prophet prohibited that. He said, do not prohibit women from going to the mosques. And, and it's a sound hadith. Where? Um, I think probably uh, on the Arabian Peninsula, you, you will find in some of the mosques in the villages. In Mecca and Medina, definitely not. There are women praying there. Mecca, uh, you'll look here, the black uh, are generally the women. In the pictures, if you see of Mecca, the Kaaba, when you see big black groupings, those are generally the women, and the white are, are the men, right? Because in that country, they, they tend to wear black and white. Uh, the men wear white, the women wear black. In Algeria, the women wear white. Uh, so that, again, is a cultural thing of color. In West Africa, where Dr. Nyang is from, women very, they're like cockatoos, you know, they're very, very colorful. Um, lot of color in, in their, uh, their hijab. And um, uh, Morocco, the, it's pretty much almost like a basic kind of unisex type uh, they, they wear a jalaba, and the differences would be in the colors, but the actual uh, jalaba is very similar. The women wear the same dress as the men do, um, except the colors uh, distinguish. So, uh -huh. The communities that do this gender separation, do they think of it and explain it as being Islam? I think, they, I think mostly they do. The, I think most of them do. You know, and you get, you know, I mean, patriarchy is a phenomenon worldwide and and we're as uh, we are as susceptible to it as any other culture I think there's been a lot of artificial mechanisms at trying to break it down but nonetheless the, you know there's still a lot of remnants I'll give you some examples in in Muslim law and Rukai is going to talk about this but in Muslim law a, a, a woman uh, does not have to uh, serve her husband in her house and she cannot be forced to if she refuses to cook, the man has to provide somebody who will cook or he has to cook himself. She is highly encouraged to do that, but it is literally within the Islamic law that she has a right to say, I don't want to cook, right? It's, in, it's based on the hadith and based on uh, uh, the scholar's interpretation, but this is literally 1400 years ago when this was, these judgments were being pronounced. Um, you know, that women, the money is theirs. If a woman earns money, she can actually go to a qadi. If the husband takes the money from her, she has a right to go to a qadi because uh, it's, it's a crime. It's not his money. Any money that comes into hers is hers, whereas the money that the, the man earns, a portion of it has to go to the woman by, by, by law. So there, it's very interesting, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the phenomenon of... of uh, the abuse of, of certain characteristics that demand certainly physical, which is changing in this country, but generally in most societies, men tend to be physically stronger and have been able to coerce uh, women physically to do things. And there's a very interesting verse in the Quran, uh, which is about Asya, the wife of Pharaoh, Pharaoh, when she says, Oh God, save me from my husband, the tyrant. And I just find that's really fascinating that that's a dua, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a prayer in the Quran from a woman about her husband who's a tyrant being asked to be saved from him. And I just wonder historically, 
you know, how many women that that has been a type of, you know, sustenance for that type, you know, in this culture as well. I mean, we have, we still have very serious problems with domestic violence, We've, and we tend to really look at the, the public space and not so much, we forget about the private space, about, uh, you know, a lot of mental cruelty, a lot, it's all still going on, um, but there's a type of openness that has emerged in the culture where these things, you know, people can talk about them. Mauritania, where uh, Sheikh Abdullah is from, uh, you know, we were talking about this, about uh, domestic violence and things like that. And it's interesting that in Mauritania, it's impossible for a man to hit a woman. It's literally impossible. One, because of tribe. In other words, m marital relationships are very, you know, they're very related to the family. And so for, for there to be any injustices towards the woman, it's going to affect very uh, heavily on relationships, inter-family relationships and things like that. And the women generally tend to be very educated from his uh, group particularly and know their rights and, and they're, they're quite, they're, they're strong women. There's no, also no polygamy in that culture at all because the women put a condition in their marriage contracts, I don't want a second wife. And they know that's a right that they have. Right? They can stipulate that in a contract and they do that. That's that the, absolutely. It's from, again, it's, it's from the scholars' understanding and interpretation that, the, and the, the, there are early community instances where that was from the companions, where that was established.